Thank you so much indeed, and us for joining us. Hope, I suppose, that's the most important word, is it? Or are there practical implications that you're concerned about right now? Certainly the latter. I mean, I would say that people are cautiously optimistic about this move. But regretfully, we've seen this film before. In 2015, we had an inclusive government. We had a government, in fact, that was so inclusive that we ended up with nine presidents, one president at the, at the top of this presidential council, Fayez Sadaj, with eight deputies that included every single faction, ethnic group, tribal group, region of Libya. So I think we have to be cautiously optimistic because there are some still some major challenges. But let's be clear, it's a symbolic gesture. It's the first unified executive in seven years. Well, we still have two outstanding issues even in this government. The first being that the Minister of Defence position has been left vacant. Now, that is, that is telling of the factions and the way in which they are still ripe for conflict. They still haven't determined whether or not they're, they're going to come to a, a long-term resolution. So in, in a sense, this is one thing that we're moving forward with, a sequence of events that could see long-term stability. But we should be cautious optimistic because there are many, many other key developments that need to take place. You've already rightfully mentioned that there are 20,000 mercenaries across the country. That is uh, uh, with a deadline that expired 90 days ago. So I think in that respect, there's still much more in this. We shouldn't neglect the elephants in the room. The, the very members of parliament that flew across the country to this meeting were met by or were in the same airport that is controlled by Russian mercenaries, the Wagner Group. So there is still so much in this. Absolutely. So the uh, interests of some members of the international community, you mentioned Wagner mercenaries, Vladimir Putin says they're nothing to do uh, with his government's policy and that they are very much there as freelancers. But what about Khalifa Haftar, the warlord who had been campaigning uh, to take over Tripoli and uh, try to depose the UN-recognized government? Where does this leave him and his domestic fighters and militias? Very, very important question. There is a military track that seeks to unify the rival networks, the rival factions of armed groups in the country. That is still a major question as to the the local factions, the Libyan Arab armed forces that is controlled by Khalifa Haftar. We still don't know the status of that. Will they be reformed? Will Khalifa Haftar still be at the helm? This question, this latter question about whether or not Khalifa Haftar will be at the helm is the central question. It goes back to the heart of the conflict. In fact, it goes back to the 10 years since the Arab Spring, since the beginning of this quest that took Libya over the last decade. And it's the question of the political character of the state. Will Libya be a, a civilian state with a neutral military, a, sub, a neutral uh, subservient military, or will its military be in control of the presidency? Now, this is not a hypothetical question. Agil Asalah, the very man that is in the image today, right, that, that, that you're showing right now, he is the de facto supreme commander of the armed forces in the Tobruk parliament. He has not transferred power to the new UN-backed government's president, because the president, not only in theory, but it's supposed to be in practice, is supposed to be the supreme commander of the armed forces. This is what I mean about leaving those issues and kicking them down the road. There are still some major elephants in the room. And I think we shouldn't just measure this by the symbolic gestures, the symbolic unification. We should measure this by the very uncomfortable questions that get right to the heart of the conflict. And I think unless we see, tra uh, uh, unless we see some real progress with uh, Khalifa Haftar's position that we still don't know anything about, whether or not Agil Asala is going to continue to play the spoiler role as he did to the last government of national accord that he rejected and Khalifa Haftar rejected because of its presidential council, because they couldn't unilaterally control it. I think we're going to keep we're going to keep kidding ourselves. And as I've said, we've seen that film before. So I think this is really the moment where the UN needs to take the charge, needs to take the reins of this next process within the UN, uh, the, the UN roadmap for Libya to its elections, which is to solve the military unification track. There are some deeply uncomfortable questions there that not only relate to the, the Wagner Group mercenaries and the entire mercenaries across the country, but also relate to the, the political character of the state. Will it be, like I said, a civilian state with a neutral subservient military, or will it be a military that has taken control of the presidency? And that, as I said, that is the heart of this conflict. OK, so another critical moment, Anas, and you're highlighting uh, further moments that will determine the true nature of Libya's future. Really appreciate your time, Anas. Thank you so much indeed. Anas El Gamati there.